surrounded by godly, Jesus-loving dads. It's, it's a blessing, and I'm thankful for you guys. Um, keep, keep fathering in the name of Jesus, right? Amen. Let's pray together this morning, and uh, we will exalt our good, good Father, our Heavenly Father, who has given us the best gift in the world in Christ. Father, thank you so much. You have brought us together this morning. Uh, Father, we have come from all over Lake Country. Uh, we've come to gather in your name, Lord Jesus, to worship and praise you because you are worthy of all of our praise. You are good and everything you do is good, Father. We're so, so thankful to have a Father we can count on. So thankful, Lord, for who you are and all that you've done. Lord, may our praise, may your word being brought forth this morning, everything we do, uh, bring you glory today. Lord, lead and guide us, prepare our hearts to hear the truth through, through song, uh, through your word, through everything we do, fellowship. Uh, we just give it all to you, again, because you are so worthy. Uh, lead our hearts now, Holy Spirit, fill us up. We can't do anything without you, so fill us up, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Um, obviously, this is not Ryan and Christy up here this morning. We've uh, been asked while they're out, and we're thankful they have a chance to be away and, and get some vacation themselves. Um, but it is, you know, it's a little bit intimidating to be up here and to try to follow in, in uh, Ryan's pathway and in his steps. I have to wear shoes for one thing, and he doesn't <laughs> like to wear shoes. Um, <laughs> but we have one thing that he doesn't usually have. We have a banjo. There you so go. And Emily. <laughs> but, um, you know, one thing that I think about as we celebrate Father's Day is that, that in the Old Testament times, they recognized God as God, and they saw him as one God. And he is one God. There's no question about that. And one of the issues that Jesus had when he, with the Pharisees was when he came down, you know, he knew he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. And, and they, they were trying to think of him as a prophet, and the Jews and the Muslims and others, they still think of Jesus as a prophet. We know him as the Son of God. But he, even when he taught the disciples how to pray, he said, pray our Father who art in heaven. And that was a new concept to them, that he was our loving, heavenly Father. And I'm going to read to you a scripture to get us started on Father's Day, because we're here to also love and celebrate our Father God, who we have the privilege of coming to through the Son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to start singing to Jesus, but then we're going to, have, we're going to sing about how good the Father is. But if you have your scripture, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, and it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, by which he made us acceptable as the beloved. That's a wonderful promise that we have. And he's a good, good father. And we're going to start by coming to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, uh, by just singing that name over and over. Jesus, Jesus, yours is the only name that matters to me. Here we go. I, we sent out song sheets. If you don't have a song sheet, it's also online on our Facebook page. Yours will be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I see. Friendship and affection I need Feel the Father smiling on me The only name that matters to me Yours is the name, the name that saved me Mercy and grace, the power that you gave me And your love is all I've ever
again. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. We've heard lots of stories of what people think he's like, but he is a good, good father. And so we want to sing that song together and just praise him and thank him as we do it. Oh, I
water's edge. It's it's a interesting day the Lord has given us, and each each Sunday is a blessing, and this morning has been a blessing. I'm so grateful for the all the many gifts up here on stage, and those gifts being utilized to give praise to God and the diversity in the body of Christ, and and uh, it's good to have a banjo every now and then. Praise God for that. And yeah, just uh, so enjoyed the time of worship up here this morning. And let me grab these before they blow away. Saw that one coming. And so I love the uniqueness every Sunday the Lord gives us in various ways. And part of the uniqueness today is uh, a couple things for me is I, I never wear a T-shirt on Sunday mornings, but I, I wanted to wear a T-shirt uh, because I got this in the mail this week. And this T-shirt is in recognition of Brother Cademan. Maybe Cademan's watching online, don't know. Maybe his parents are glad they could get away. But Cademan is going on uh, international missions all next year. And so this is his organization that talks about the different nations in which Cademan will be going to. And so you too can have a free T-shirt uh, if you give. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you, if you'd like to be a part of that ministry and to support Cademan next year, we love sending our, our people out. Uh, into the, what we call the beyond here at Water's Edge. Uh, the beyond is simply those areas outside of this region, outside of Lake Country. We know that God's planted us right here in the heart of Lake Country, and He's called us to minister here. But then He wants us to also just have this world vision. And so Cayman is going uh, into the beyond uh, soon, and we want to support Him in, in that endeavor. So uh, I wore a T-shirt, and I was thinking, man, I was thinking like early in the week it's going to be 95 degrees today, and then God gave us an overcast day. Uh, change the temperatures, and so it's it's beautiful. So I feel really good up here. <laughs> it's cool weather, and I'm in a t-shirt. This is great. Uh, but I see a lot of clouds in the backdrop, and I think, what, what, what God has in store there? Uh, and so I was thinking that the message today is, is unique for me because it's it's actually the longest sermon, uh, probably recorded, I guess, in all the scriptures, maybe, unless you look at one of the prophets' books and writings as a whole sermon, if you will, but uh, it's the longest sermon in the book of Acts, and it's like four or five pages of scripture. And if you've been with us for some time, you know that for me, four or five verses uh, is enough to fill a few hours. And so four or five pages of scripture, like how do you walk through all that? And does God want me to break it down and to uh, segment it somehow and, and change it up somehow? And I don't think so. I think he wants us to go through the history and, and to see all that God has uh, given to us historically in this message from a man named Stephen and to pray how then for us, how that might apply to us and what we can learn from this story that God's given us in the scriptures. We know the overarching story, the overarching beauty is that God's gospel is going to advance. The good news is going to advance. In the book of Acts, in the early church then, the actions that were taking place, God's gospel is advancing today, just like we're sending a caveman out to the nations. We know it's advancing and God's building his church. He's faithful. He's always going to be faithful. But we're going to learn from a faithful brother this morning named Stephen. And Stephen basically is going to give a history lesson. All right? So, uh, for those of you who all love history, you're thinking, great, I love history lessons. But some of you all may be thinking, well, what would the history of Israel have to do with us? Well, uh, we need to still pause and think about that and how it eventually leads to the coming of Christ. God chose to work through the nation of Israel, chose a specific nation, a specific people, to work through them to bring the Messiah. And the Messiah would be the Messiah of all nations and all peoples that trust in Him. And that means that's for us today as well. So history is important. But I was reminded this morning... And I've heard this story different times over the past two, three, four, five years since, uh, since Levi was younger, and it gets brought up uh, time and time again. It's brought up during his graduation weekend. I may not have all the details just right, but here's the gist of it. So a number of years ago, Jody took Levi and our kids to Williamsburg uh, to learn about what? History, right? To learn about the history of, uh, of uh, uh, all that's there, to learn about the history of Virginia and uh, early colonies and so forth uh, in Williamsburg. And so they're there, and you can go on the tours and receive all this history and so forth. And my mom was there as well, Levi's uh, Nana. And, and Nana gave Levi an opportunity, I think, one of these days, it, and Jody did as well. said, Levi, you can go with us, Jody said. You can go with us to search out and learn more about the history of Williamsburg. Uh, or, or I think Nana gave him the opportunity uh, that he could go with her, and she was going to go thrift storing, yeah, thrifting, I think, at a thrift stores. And... And you're not going to believe this, but Levi chose to go with Nana to the thrift stores. <laughs> now, you may be thinking, well, wow, Levi really enjoys thrifting that much. No, no, he doesn't. I think he has that much angst against history <laughs> uh, as he's growing up. 
Now, hopefully that'll change. Uh, history for me wasn't my favorite topic as a younger lad, but I grew in time to enjoy history and appreciate history. And so history, though, is important. Uh, and so we want to learn from the, the history that God's given us this morning and, and see how that applies to us as God's people. Now, a question we could ask, if we want to make some application to our culture, we don't always connect it directly sometimes in regards to a given Sunday, but today is Father's Day. And so I thought about that in regards to Father's Day, how would this message possibly uniquely apply to fathers? And so let me just plant this seed, and you can, uh, you can think about it this way, dads that are here, is that we're going to learn about Stephen. Stephen's the first martyr uh, in the church uh, that's recorded for us, at least in the book of Acts. And so it's kind of a heavy story as to what takes place. It has its gravity without question because he loses his life. But there's also the gladness, the joy, the, the glory you get to see in the midst of the story because God's fulfilling his purposes. And so it has both. It has gravity and it has gladness. But I'm going to raise a question here. We don't know. Uh, at least I, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever seen it recorded or uh, researched it out over the years looking at the life of Stephen. But uh, I wonder if Stephen was a father. I wonder if Stephen had kids. I wonder if Stephen had a wife and, and children uh, in this context in which you'll hear of him this morning. And so maybe we can just assume that he did. I think it's probably high probability that he had he had possibly children, and and yet uh, he stands very faithfully for Christ here that takes him away from his children, if you will, and his wife. And so I want us to ask the question: Was he a father? Just think about that. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But if so, uh, what can we learn from this man named Stephen, either as a father, if we want to apply it that way, or just for all of us today? Here's a faithful brother who stands for Christ in the midst of difficult times. And I think we can learn from him, and I pray that we will as we walk through history. So you pray for me as we walk through a lot of history this morning. We get to the end to see what, it, what it's uh, what is uh, applicable to us that God has for us this morning. And uh, also just pray that it seems like a great distance. And so Levi, there's a good chance I'm coming down there. I feel, I feel like I want to be close to you guys this morning. I feel like I'm far away. And so let me just come in here and talk about history, and uh, we'll see how that unfolds here shortly as well. Lord, we thank you for the chance to be here today and to uh, be in your word. And so now as we open up your scriptures, uh, Father God, would you lead us by your spirit? There's much that can be covered, and there's no way we can uh, go into the depths that uh, are here, scratching the surface, Lord. But I think I think you have for us this morning, it's why I've been transparent with this, is I've been wrestling with it, just just to hear hear the whole word of God, just to hear, hear the story retold. Lord, as we retell the story, though, we want to understand the point of the story, understand what you have for us in it. And so, Lord, may, may that be seen. Uh, by what you'd have me to share, may that be seen by what is heard and how people here, body of Christ, body of Christ by the Spirit of Christ, would also apply it for your glory. And uh, we pray blessing upon fathers that are here and fathers that are watching, Lord. And uh, we ask you to lead us now by your Spirit in this time. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. So, so we are in the Book of Acts, and like I said maybe for time's sake I may paraphrase, paraphrase going through some of the story. But in the book of Acts, and uh, Pastor Mike did a great job yesterday, uh, last week rather, of giving a great insight about where we were in the book of Acts in regards to uh, a critical uh, season where the church was expanding, right? I mean, it was, it was growing and expanding in great ways. And because of all the expansion, uh, the, the disciples, uh, rather the apostles, you know, they needed help. And so what happened uh, was that they called everybody together and said, hey, we need to delegate more things out to the church family, and so they did that. They delegated items out to the church family, and and so uh, people stepped up, began to fulfill their, fulfill their roles, and so the apostles would say, focused on on the Word, right? You say focused on the Word and prayer, and so that's taking place, and the church is multiplying. It's just growing rapidly in Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem, and so we, we come to that setting this morning in Acts chapter 6, uh, Acts chapter 7, as well, and so if you want to follow along, you can in your scriptures in Acts chapter six. Uh, but we'll be looking through Acts chapter seven as well, or just listen to the story as I as I read and paraphrase for time's sake on some of these aspects, as we see what God has in store for us uh, in in this letter to us from Him. So in Acts chapter six, here's the backstory about the Stephen. We learn that Stephen is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, uh, and that it tells us in the closing words of last week that as they were proclaiming Christ, that many people are coming to Jesus, and it says a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And that's the first time I think I've seen that recorded in the book of Acts, is that is that they're actually priests. Uh, those inside the religious system of the Jewish people are beginning to see that this one named Jesus that they've been teaching and preaching, he is the Messiah. 
And so now they're coming to Christ. So think about that and based on what we've seen over the past uh, several months in looking at Acts, is, is that John and Peter, early disciples, have already been dragged into the council two times, right? And, and, and both times they were let go, uh, but they were beaten as they were brought in before the council. They've been told not to preach the name of Jesus. And Peter would say, well, listen, you know, it's up for you to decide. Uh, it's between God and you, but we can only speak and teach and preach that which we have seen and heard. And so we're going with God. We're going we're gonna to preach Christ. We've seen the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and so we're going with him. And so they were then cast out of the council, beaten, uh, you know, reprimanded. And so now you have priests. You have priests that are coming to Jesus. And, and we know the council, the religious leaders of the day, the high priests and the the religious of the, uh, leaders of the day in, in Jerusalem, if they're seeing other priests at lower ranks, per se, coming to Christ and being a witness for the Messiah, that's got to ruffle their feathers. There's, there's a little tension beginning to uh, 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 be created in the early church days after the ascension of Christ. And so the tension is there. And Stephen is a man of faith. He's a man of the Holy Spirit. He's a man of wisdom. He's a man of power. The power comes from the Holy Spirit. And it tells us here early in the story, and I think it might be easier just to paraphrase some, it tells us in the story of Stephen here in Acts chapter 7. You can read this uh, on your own this evening. But in Acts chapter 7, it tells us that Stephen is, is preaching the gospel. He's doing wonders and signs, uh, just like the apostles. God chose to give Stephen some more powers by the Holy Spirit, just like he gave Peter and John. And Stephen is doing wonders and signs as he's proclaiming and testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what happens with this tension, with these priests that are coming to Christ, uh, Jews that are rejecting Christ, is that the Jews get together and say, Stephen has to be dealt with. And it tells us inside the story here in chapter 7 that they had five different groups that basically came together. It could have been five different synagogues, like Jewish synagogues that were gathering together. Uh, but we see five different groups that are mentioned here in Acts chapter 7 uh, that gather together against, against Stephen. They do not like his message. And they want, they want Stephen dealt with, okay, is the context here. And so these five come together, and it tells us in the scriptures here that they're trying to refute Stephen, but kind of an interesting word from, from Luke that he records, it says in verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so as, as Stephen was seeking to be led by the Spirit of God, it tells us that, that based on how he was communicating and speaking, that these opposers of him simply could not shut him down. There was too much wisdom, too much, uh, too much uh, power in his words and authority in how he's sharing. And whatever was taking place, they could not refute Stephen. He, he was just bold in his proclamation, and they could not shut him down. It made me think of our theme verse that's on the wall inside our building that, that's still tied to this, this year. We combined uh, Book of Acts and, and 2 John. Book of Acts, part of it, is we are to press forward and proclaim the kingdom of God. We're to do so in truth and love. If we do it in truth and love, then we believe that God's grace and peace and mercy will be with us. And so what I see here is I believe that Stephen, in the context of a very hostile situation where Jewish people are rising up to shut him down, that he is speaking in truth and in love and with God's wisdom and power that they cannot refute him. They can't get the best of him. They can't get him to uh, you know, turn tail and go home. Hey, listen, I, just, I, I love Jesus. I, I love the Father. I understand our history. I understand what God is doing. God has revealed himself now to the Messiah. He's been crucified, buried, and risen. And, and so he's grounded in this message. In love, he's communicating it. They're wanting to shut him down, and they can't do it. They can't touch him with his words. And I just think there's probably wholesomeness in how Stephen is proclaiming Christ uh, to his own people, which he loves. There's opposition, but he's doing it in truth and in love. And so with that kind of power of the Holy Spirit, they simply cannot shut down Stephen. Well, Oftentimes, the enemy is not going to be satisfied with that then. Well, how can we shut them down? Well, then the story changes. So in order to shut them down, it tells us they, they begin to make false accusations against Stephen. They, they make false accusations that Stephen is saying uh, blasphemous things against the temple, the place where they worship. You know, the temple is very significant in the, in the days of Christ there in Jerusalem, as you can imagine. We'll come back to that. They begin to make uh, statements that Stephen was blasphemous towards God. Uh, he somehow is blaspheming God, and he's blaspheming uh, Moses, our great patriarch, and, and, the, and the words of the law. Somehow Stephen is somehow being uh, 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 heretical and, and uh, wrong towards the teachings that we have always held to as a people, and so he must be dealt with. So Stephen wasn't doing that. 
as we'll see, he was just being faithful to, to proclaim the kingdom of God through the people's own history. But the history story tells us that there's a Messiah coming and he's come. His name's Jesus. So they want to shut him down. A part of that shutting down, they also then, they bring false witnesses that say certain things about him. Uh, it says in secret, they do this. That's how the enemy works oftentimes. He'll, he'll grab some people and he'll get a, a, a false narrative, a false story, and a false accusations, a false testimony. That testimony, maybe they have some reputation in the community. That'll be planted into the seed, into the, the context that order, in order to shut down Stephen in this case. It's how the enemy works. If the enemy was truthful, why would, he, why would he do it in secret? But it says in the scriptures he does it in secret because Stephen has something to hide. He simply wanted to be faithful to the Lord. And so it happens then, it happens today. Uh, we, we know in different contexts, we understand there's false stories, false narratives, fake news, if you will, that's out there. Just a reality of life. We, we understand that in our own context, do we not? We know there's falsehoods. And so, so it happened to Stephen, unfortunately. So what they do is they go and grab Stephen. They go and see Stephen, and they seize him, these five different groups that's mentioned in Acts 7. And so what do they do? They take him to the council. This is the council, the high priest, the highest religious authority of the day in Jerusalem, the high priest, the Sanhedrin, the various councils, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the religious leaders, if you will. It's, they are there, the council is there, and Stephen is now before them. We've seen in the book of Acts so far that this council has not been favorable to the message of Christ. This council is among the religious leaders who had Jesus crucified, and now Stephen is standing before them at this council. So you, you understand the, the context, right? You understand it's, it's an intense situation. There's, there's great gravity. There's a, there's a seriousness, and there's, there's a weightiness, and, and they're wanting to shut down Stephen at any cost. They didn't bring in false narratives uh, and false stories and, and false witnesses, and we are going to shut down this Stephen. I might just ask this question in a moment here. Uh, when man wants to shut down the good news and shut down the gospel, do you think man is going to be successful? No, that's the whole cool story of the book of Acts, is that, is that no matter the opposition and persecution, God's story, God's message is going to continue. That's why we're here this morning. It has continued. You already know the answer. We are victorious in Jesus Christ. Stephen is going to be victorious, even though his outcome may seem not victorious to those from a human perspective, a flesh perspective, a, a lack of spiritual God-like perspective, but it's victorious. That's why we're here today. Stephen's message carries on because the gospel carries on, but they want to shut him down. Now, what's interesting here at the end of this section of, this actually, I'm still in chapter 6. I've been saying 7, I'm still in 6, so it means we've got a lot to cover, is that it tells us when they, they are confronting Stephen before the council, it says that they were staring at him. They, they, were, they, they were fixed upon Stephen, like, man, you were in trouble, right? And it tells us that Stephen, as they're looking at him, had the face of a, an angel. Isn't that interesting? The face of an angel. It's kind of an interesting description for, for a man or interesting description for a father, if you will, if he was a dad. They had the face of an angel. I take that to mean, when I remember angels coming up in Scripture, I think about the resurrection of Christ and the angels there telling the, the ladies, hey, he's risen, he's risen. There's like a glow around them, right? And so I think we'll see that come up at the end of the story. I, I sense the face of an angel. I, I think there's just something that's special going down. There's something that you almost sense God's presence, uh, God, God's um, blessing, God's favor, uh, God's like uh, anointing on Stephen, uh, Stephen in a way that physically people are saying, you know what, you know, we're against this guy. We're going to take him down, but there's something different about him. You cannot, you cannot deny that as I look at this guy, like, I, I don't know, man, it's like he's, like he's glowing or, or so, some, something. He's, he, he doesn't seem like an enraged lunatic. He seems like he's grounded in truth and love and power and authority, and there's something different about him, but because of the rejection of God, they're going to reject Stephen. And they're going to take him down. If I pause as I think about it, if the Spirit leads me, like application for us as dads, or obviously for all of us, then what might be an application even now for us? Fathers, we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, hard situations that are challenging. Maybe, we're, maybe we have false accusations against us, uh, false witnesses, challenges at work that aren't true, uh, because maybe tied back to, I pray, uh, our faith in Christ, or always grounded in Christ, and those things come difficult times and seasons, should we have a face of, of vitriol? Uh, should we have a face of, of rage towards people? Or maybe God in our crises that we will face, that you will face, any of us face as we walk through life, life's not easy, we know that. 
That can be hard, but God is holy. And if he's with us, then, then maybe we, like Stephen, we can't control what God does for us and how he makes us look towards other people, right? But maybe we can have a face of an angel as well. Just a thought. To have a, a kind, loving face. A kind, loving face might be a very serious face at times. It might be a very intense face at times. It might be full of gravity and weightiness that you sense that, but they also sense that there's something different about that, that woman or about that man, or about that father, that mother, that child, as they are seeking to walk in Christ. I, I sense, even though I'm angry at them, that there's something different about them. There's a truth and a love and a groundedness there and a power that's there that, that, that speaks to me even if I reject it. I thought to think about well, here's kind of a cool thing. Here's how chapter 7 begins. It says in verse 1, chapter 7, And the high priest, that's the highest authority in all the land, he says these things, Are these things so? That's the question he asks of Stephen. So Stephen, we've got all these false accusations against you, against the, the holy place, our temple, the law, Moses, God. You're, you're a blasphemous uh, man in the context of our religious culture. How dare you? And so the high priest says, Are these things so? And then... Following that question, we have probably what it seems like. I don't know how quickly uh, Steve was able to do this. Um, I read through it and timed myself. It's, it's at least a, a, like a 12, 13, 14 minute message that Luke gives us. If you're reading all the way through the storyline. And so Stephen, he answers the question by giving the people a history lesson of Israel. With a point. And the point is always going to point to who? Church. Jesus. But here's what I want us to notice is that I think as we look to this history lesson, is that Stephen could have probably, if he wanted to, this would be a great place to bail out. You know, he, he's given an open door, but he does not have to take the open door to speak about Jesus. Because I assume he understands that if he speaks about Jesus, that the outcome in speaking about Jesus from a human standpoint may not be very favorable. So he has an opportunity to close down the discussion, to close the door, say, well, high priest, I hear what you're saying, um, but I actually, you know, I've not been blasphemous, and and I've not spoken against the temple, uh, or against the law, or against Moses. Actually, I, I look at all those things that, were, that have been brought up just the way you do, and we're on the same page. I'm sorry for the for the confusion, and so if it's okay, you know, I apologize for anything I've done, and can we call it a day and go home? I mean, he could have done that. He could have tried some approach like that, but he takes the opportunity as the doors open, as we're going to see, share the history of Israel that points to the, the glory of Christ. I'll give, give the application while we're here in a moment is that fathers or all of us here do you think that God's going to open up doors for us in our context, in our culture to speak about the glory of God, whether it's the historical perspective, maybe we take it all the way back to creation and, and we look at the glory of God in creation that we then lead it back up to the glory of God in, in Christ that those doors may open for us as well, and we have an opportunity either to be obedient or disobedient, to walk through those doors, or to say, 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 say no and close the doors. I hope we're going to see with Stephen, he walks through the door. I hope we'll walk through the door. Dads, walk through the door. Look for doors that are open, right? You know, you're going to see Stephen take the story back to, back to uh, Abraham. He could have taken it back to Genesis. Oftentimes, the doors open for us all the time. It comes to weather and the creative order. And I'm, I'm feeling a light in this. It feels pretty good up here to me. How about you guys? So that's why I said, I don't know what God's got in store today. I don't, know if, I, don't, I don't think I can just jump through all this history in a, in a heartbeat, but I, I will if I have to. But here's the thing. The door, the door is open, and Stephen walks through it, and creation is a great way to open the door. Oftentimes, we speak, I speak with Roy this morning. Roy's gotten back from being out in Arizona out west. He sent back some pictures of, of, the, of the sunset. I think maybe the sun rising as well in Arizona. You know, big sky country out there and the, the glory of God and the desert land and so forth. And it's kind of like the ocean, the mountains, uh, even lake country. Uh, sometimes we see just, man, God, this is so glorious, right? And somebody, someone might say, hey, Mother Nature is pretty cool, whatever. And, and you understand that Mother Nature term for them may have no reference to a God who created things that you worship. And you might say, yeah, um, and I'm glad I, I, I know uh, who actually created this. It's God and isn't God a, a, an incredible creator, you know, he created Adam and Eve, he created us, we're created his image, we love life, and he created this for us to enjoy, and, and somehow we maybe if God was a door, we can walk through that to say, but man, you know, just like Adam sinned, I sinned, and I fall short, though, to live out in a way that glorifies this great creator, and, 
But I mean, I'm, I'm so glad there's a, there's hope to my sinfulness, hope to my rebellion against the glory of God who created this. And his name is Jesus. I don't, I don't know how he might open the doors, but the reality is there's so many different ways that the door gets open. We can walk through the door and testify about the goodness of God. Stephen does this. He does this through history. I'll see if I can read a few words and then maybe paraphrase a few words for our time to get through this much history. Here's what he says. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia and before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go to the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God moved him from there to this land that we're part of. That's the land of Israel. And so God moved him there. But check this out in verse 5. It says, Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length. But he promised to give it to him as, an, as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And so the promise is there. But the promise is given with, uh, with some pretty challenging perspective moving forward. He says this, and God spoke to this, to this effect. He says, listen, Abraham, you're, this offspring that you're going you're gonna to have that's going to inherit all this land, they're going to be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. That's the enslavement in, in Egypt. But then he says, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they... After that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And so it concludes by saying that, that Abraham uh, was given the covenant of circumcision, a mark to testify he was uh, you know, part of God's uh, chosen. And it says Abraham then became the father of Isaac, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob the twelve, the twelve patriarchs. And so in mentioning the storyline of Abraham, that's the beginning point of this history lesson that, that Stephen gives. And he brings us up to the patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, just a couple of interesting insights about Abraham is that it tells us that Abraham was given this promise right of the, of the, of the land of, of Israel. Uh, but up to that point that we see here, and he eventually passes away. It's for his offspring, his coming. He would not only be the, the father of, of Israel, he was the father of many nations. Uh, the kingdom of God, if you will, is coming uh, through Abraham, it basically comes through Christ. But what's interesting is it tells us that Abraham did not get uh, one, one foot length of that land in his day and time. You think about that, how Stephen records that. It's like God says, hey, Abraham, I got, I got this incredible blessing for you, and, and here it is. Um, but, but, you know, you don't get any part of it in some respects. Now, God, God blessed Abraham in various ways. But I thought about that. I said, isn't that interesting that the promise was given to Abraham, but he didn't get one foot of that land. It did come to his people. But the analogy for me it came back to donuts. I don't know why it always does on Sunday mornings, but I was thinking about donuts. And I was thinking about, you ever think about donuts, Reed? Some of you guys? Anyway, I was thinking about donuts. And I was thinking about, what if somebody came to me and said, Bo, you are going to inherit um, a donut empire. You're going to have a donut dynasty, very similar to Blue Creek Cove. And you're going to inherit something like that. And you're going to have this dynasty of just donut shops all over the nation. And, and I'm thinking, well, that'd be kind of cool, right? And so if I think about God coming to me and saying, hey, you get that blessing of a donut dynasty, then what my mind begins to think of, in our context, I'm thinking, I get a few free donuts along the way, right? I'm specifically thinking of number 15 over here. It's, uh, it comes hot uh, when you order it, hot and ready to eat, and it has uh, strawberry uh, syrup icing poured over it, and you put some sprinkles on that, number 15, just as a hint there. And man, it is delicious, right? Some of you guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? Because I, I ran some errands after prayer yesterday, and I saw a bunch of trucks over there at Blue Creek Cove that looked familiar. I was a little bit worried. Especially when I came back an hour later, I was hoping, I hope they're gone, because they're not there. i got to get in there, and i got to do some church discipline. Um, so, but if I think I'm going to inherit a kingdom of, of donut, a donut dynasty, now I want to kind of partake, right? What if I never got even number 15, one bite of a donut? And that's kind of what's told here about Abraham. Very interesting. Now it comes, it comes to his, his offspring, right? But here's what I'm thinking for us, is that we have the promises of God. God's given us his promises, it's in his word. But just like Abraham, some of the promises that we have and we trust in and we hold to that encourage us and inspire us to, to live out Christ-likeness, we don't control how God delivers that in, in his timing, in, in the way he does it, 
and, and how he blesses us, we can hold the promises of God with conviction, right? But exactly how they play out, that's, that's up to him. That's up to his, his timing and, and how he wants to do that for us. And so we, we hold the promises, yes, um, but we trust in him. And so Abraham had to do that. He received blessings along the way. But this great promise of being uh, you know, a father of many nations and father of the nation of this land is forthcoming. It's not yet. But it leads up to the, it leads up to the patriarchs. Hey, one last thought. When this promise was given to Abraham, did he, did he even have a son? <laughs> did he even have an offspring? He didn't, right? He didn't even have a son. And, and it even says that, oh, by the way, this land you're going to inherit, inherit before you get there, your, gener your generations after you are going to be enslaved for 400 years. It's, it seems almost like a very hopeless situation. Like, enslaved 400 years, and I don't even have a son yet? Well, you know the full story. Stephen can't get into all of it, but God's going to give Abraham what? A son. He gives him Isaac. And God's going to do what? With the enslaved people. He's going to deliver them. And the deliverance is going to have a point to point to Jesus ultimately. So we are not promised, simply because we have the promises of God, that we won't walk through very difficult and hard and trying circumstances. Are you with me on that? Does that make sense? Um, amen, Jody? I mean, th this life we're going to have difficulties and hardships and struggles. It, and it doesn't mean that God is not with us. We, we prayed yesterday at the men's prayer about various challenges and struggles of life and so forth. And I'm so grateful for uh, the prayer we have. And the ladies are, are, are gathered together to pray as well. And as we pray, we'll talk about life's challenges and life's hardships and life's life difficulties. And, and, and sometimes if we're not careful, we say, where is God in the midst of that? We're going to see here in the, in the history lesson of the nation of Israel, I mean, 400 years of slavery and, and I can't even have a child and yet I'm going to hear all these things. Is we're going to see that even though seasons are difficult, God is in the midst of the difficult seasons with his people that trust in him. He's sovereign. He's providentially carrying things out for his, his glory. And we, we are called to be at peace with that. All right, God, you got this. You're in control. So Abraham gets a promise. He passes away. He has 12 sons. And so you have the nation of Israel forming, right? And then, and then Stephen uh, goes on to speak about the, the 12 tribes, specifically 12 brothers, but specifically about one brother, Joseph. <laughs> Joseph didn't get a very good hand dealt by his brothers. And so that's where he goes next. Hey, let me pause and ask this question. I wonder why Stephen begins with with Abraham and telling a history story because he's he's in a he's in a hot hot fix right here, and he just begins telling a story about Abraham and the patriarchs. He's going to lead to Moses, and that was some of the opposition against him. Like you know, you kind of hate Moses. You're twisting his words. You don't believe in the word. You don't believe in the temple and all these things. And he, I think he's just connecting with the people. Like, hey, I'm with you. Oh, I love our history. You know, I, I'll even go back further before Abraham, before Moses, rather. Let me talk about Abraham. Let me go a little further back. Like, man, I mean, we're all in this together. If you had time to look through the details, it says that Stephen's saying, our fathers, our fathers, our fathers. He's collecting, he's concluding himself with the story he's telling the, the council that wants to, wants to hang him, basically. Hey, we're in this together. We have an incredible story with God. And let me repeat some of the story. So then Joseph now comes up in the storyline. And... Acts chapter 7, verse 9. And he begins to tell the story of Joseph. So let me just paraphrase basically the story. It tells us that, that Joseph was sold into slavery. You remember that story well? Um, he was sold into, guess where? Egypt. But it says God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So the story of Joseph is told. And that's an incredible story uh, to read in the, in the uh, works of God in Genesis uh, about what God did with Joseph and how what man meant for evil, God meant for what? Good, right? It's a beautiful story. And so Stephen recollects uh, and shares some of that story about, about Joseph. And it's neat to see that God was with Joseph and delivered him. But Joseph was the one who was sold off into slavery by his brothers. And you fast forward several years after he had had a hardship. I think I think Joseph was in prison, right, for some 14 years, if I recall correctly. Uh, I remember that number because it reminds me of uh, uh, the Voice of Martyrs uh, founder. Um, his name will come to me in a moment. Who was in prison in Romania for some 14 years as well. I think it was 14 years for Joseph. But he's in prison. He eventually becomes uh, a helpmate to the 
king of Egypt base becomes the second in command of all of Egypt. And what happens is a great famine happens uh, for Jacob and his and his sons. All right, and so a great famine happens, and now Joseph's been sold off. They think he's dead, um, and he's in Egypt, and he's become second in all of command, and he stores and, and helps uh, save Egypt, other nations around him by storing all this food. And then the brothers are sent to Egypt to do what? To find food because they're all going to die. You know, there's a famine. There's no food in the land. So they come, to, they come to Egypt and Joseph's there. And so Stephen tells us in the storyline here uh, that it was the second time that his brothers came to Egypt that he revealed himself to them. He said, listen, I'm, I'm the brother that you sold off into slavery. Uh, I'm second in command of all of Egypt. I can take care of you. I can take care of my father. I'll tell you what, uh, you with your, your wives and your children, bring back dad and all of you all will move here near me so I can provide and care for you. And so that's what takes place. It tells us uh, 75, I think it was, that, that came. It was this great caravan of all these brothers and family and kids. They're moved to Egypt. Why? Because Joseph is going to care for them and watch over them. We know ultimately that care is coming from whom? The providential hand of God. God has allowed Joseph to become second in power uh, as he's tying back these promises are coming and been given to Abraham, but now coming through Abraham and, and, and uh, Isaac and Jacob, they're coming this direction. And, and so God is at work providing for his people, showing favor. And so Stephen decides to give them that memory lesson about uh, what God was doing with Stephen, I mean with Joseph. Now, if I think about this, I should pause and say this. In one respect, Joseph ends up being a leader for his own people, uh, Joseph also was rejected by his brothers, right? That's probably an important point. He was rejected by his brothers, so often to slavery, but he ends up being a blessing to them, delivering the people, right? I wonder if there's some application or some pictures that Stephen wants to plant that God wants us to see about these people he brings up in the history of, of Israel. Well, this history concludes by uh, eventually... Uh, Jacob went down into Egypt, and there Jacob eventually died. Um, and so they, they buried uh, him and buried his family. And then if I fast forward the story, then in verse 17 of chapter 7, if you follow in your Bible, it says, But as the time of promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. Time has passed now. Joseph has passed away. He's brought his brothers there. The, the Hebrew people, God's people, have been multiplying and growing and growing and growing, and time has lapsed. And now Joseph is gone. That, that initial Egyptian king that uh, Joseph knew, you know, he's passed and gone. And so I don't know how many years, but you fast forward, and now there's a, a, a new king, and the Hebrew people have grown and multiplied in this foreign land, if you will. But now this new king that has risen up, he doesn't know Joseph. He didn't know all the history story. And what he sees is a massive, a massive crowd, if you will, of Hebrew people that if there's numbers, uh, and those numbers aren't initially for us or at least been a part of us from the very beginning, maybe there are opposition, and so tension arises, and so the Egyptian king, he wants to shut down the Hebrew people. How does he do that in the story? You remember? He wants to shut down their newborns. This is what it tells us. It says, he began to deal shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. So he wants to kill the kids. There seems to be, it's interesting how you can step back, you know, thousands of years and you see sometimes the actions of man. Back then, we're, we're, we're a progressive uh, people, right? We're progressive uh, uh, humanity is progressive and we always get better and so sometimes you can look back and you see the same same uh, wickedness of man is the same wickedness today because I think in our own culture today that oftentimes in our own way uh, we plead for a culture of death versus a culture of life God help us so that's what the king wanted to do he wanted to shut him down well Stephen's paraphrasing, obviously, to work through much history, but now he comes to Moses. You remember the story about Moses and how, you know, they were fearful that he would be killed by the king and the edict was put out, and so, you know, they, they, they put him out where he would be found um, by someone to care for him, and he gets found by, guess who? Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, this crazy story, right? And so, 
he gets brought up in the household of the highest authorities and powers to be in Egypt. I wonder if God has something in store for that. See, God, God's an amazing, he, he's an amazing God. He does stuff that sometimes is hard to fathom. I can imagine the heartbrokenness of the Hebrew people in some respects seeing even the mom of Moses, seeing what's taking place, and, but the fact that he's going to be cared for is gladness, but then there's also gravity because he's being raised in, in this context uh, 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 underneath the pagan gods and, and pagan rule, and the Egyptian king actually is killing our kids, and now our own child is being raised there. And so there's gladness that his life is spared. There's great gravity because of the context and the circumstance that is darkness in regards to the, the true God of Israel and how God revealed himself. So both these things are unfolding at the same time. And I just get encouraged to know that in the midst of things that probably at times I can't understand and know what God's doing is that God's in the midst of it. He's working. I want to see what God's doing. Well, God's doing something here with Moses. Because you all already know the end of the story, right, where things progress here. And so Moses is spared and he's raised up. And it says, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. A great leader among the Egyptian people. But check this out. When he was 40, I love this phrase. It says in verse 23, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. It came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel can't camp out anywhere in this history lesson because we're trying to get through this morning, right? But as I see that phrase, it came into his heart, and then later it says that Moses was hoping that his own people, the children of Israel, although he was raised as an Egyptian, he was one of them. He was hoping that his own people would know that God was giving them salvation through his hand. And so Moses knew somehow that God providentially had his hand upon him to be a deliverer for God's people. He knew that early on. And it tells us, though, that it tells us that God brought him up um, uh, in Egypt, and it says God gave, uh, came into his heart to visit his brothers. I just want to acknowledge sometimes we see it, the, the providential hand of God at work in the lives of people. You know, Jesus would say in his day and time that no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. The Spirit draws people to, the, to God. And here we see that God's putting it in the heart and mind of Moses, that Moses... You know, yeah, you've got a plush life right here as an Egyptian um, uh, uh, son, if you will, but, but I've got something else for you because you're a son of Israel, and I'm going to make you the deliverer of my people. And so God puts in his heart, though, maybe it was stirring somehow, or Moses could say, you know what, I just woke up one day and said, you know what, I think instead of living in Egypt, I'm going to go be the ruler of the uh, Hebrew people and, and bring them out of slavery and bondage. Uh, I don't know if he thought it that way, but somehow we see here in Scripture that God put in his heart and mind do something unique for him. I think there's a lot of correlations of salvation personally with that. I'll just plant that seed. Uh, in the moment I'll share a, a brief story that comes to mind. Uh, some of you all know we celebrated some different graduations uh, a few weeks ago this past weekend and uh, celebrated mom with Levi. He's behind the camera. Uh, he's got one more Sunday with us. Uh, we'll look forward to sending him off here soon uh, with uh, gladness, in one respect, with great gravity in regards to the heaviness of heart. But I was sharing at Levi's graduation, wanting to encourage them, some things that I was pleased with, with him and how God's hand has graciously been, grace has been to us as parents and gracious to him and just want to encourage my son. And I, I shared some stories, some memories that probably you, you parents have done this over the years. And I shared at an event, like, I'm going to wait till uh, another night to share my favorite story about Levi. And I ended up, I got sick, and our family didn't get to meet anymore after that, that night or whatever. And so I never got back together to share that story. I feel in the moment I'm going to share it right now. So Levi, here's, the, here's what I shared at the dinner in Richmond about my favorite story about Levi. It's this. And I asked my, I asked my family to think about what do you think it might be. And, uh, but it's this. Several years ago, I had it recorded on my phone for several years. Eventually it faded, faded off or, or, or was gone, or I got a new phone. I can't remember exactly. I kept it for years. But uh, I forget the exact age of Levi, but it was several, several years ago. He was just a, a smaller tot. And uh, they were going away for the weekend. We've been together on Sunday like this. We worshiped the Lord together. And then they were going to visit my parents down at Thompson Beach, and they're heading away. And uh, I remember I got a phone call. I didn't get the call, but I got the message. I left the message on my phone uh, sometime that Sunday evening. And Levi, in a small kid's voice, which made it so adorable, he's, he was said basically this. He said, Dad, 
He said, uh, Mom wanted me to call you. I just need to call you. He said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know why it is. But, but God just put it in my heart today to believe in Jesus. Amen. And I saved that for years. And what I love about it is the theology wrapped up in the voice and the words of a small kid. That God put it in my heart to believe in Jesus. God is the author of salvation. I believe God put it in the heart of Moses. Hey, go check on the, the Hebrew people. Now is the time. So Moses goes. You know the story recorded in Genesis? Moses goes to his people. Uh, he sees one of his uh, people, uh, his brothers, being uh, abused in some way, oppressed, injustice somehow. And so Moses takes things in his own hands with authority he had underneath the Egyptian rule. Uh, and he actually has an Egyptian person that was oppressing this Hebrew brother killed. And so, uh, pretty serious situation there. But he's wanting, he's wanting to stand up for, for, his, for his, his family, his brothers, right? Well, he does that. He comes back uh, later again, wanting to visit his people. And he's hoping they're going to understand, hey, listen, I, I have all this power and authority because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver you people. I'm going to be your savior, if you will. And he comes back again. And he sees two of his own brothers, though, fighting. There should be unity, but two brothers are fighting, right? And, and there, there's this unity. And so he steps in and says, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, you, you've got the Egyptian people against you now and, and impressing upon you and, and killing our babies, and, and you guys got to be unified. You all cannot be fighting each other. You, you can't be doing that. And, and so he gets on them, and, and, he, and, he, and he, 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 he rebukes them. And then one of the guys kind of pushes them away and says, listen, Moses, who are you to come speak into our lives? Who all of a sudden made you, made you, uh, you know, prince and god of us? Who, who made you our deliverer, if you will? What are you going to do? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? That's one of the little stories that Stephen tells us that was part of the reasoning that Moses did what? He realized the people didn't understand and see him as a deliverer, see them as the leader he thought he was going to be, and so he flees. He leaves. He's gone for several years. Moses is rejected. Hey, if I remember right, Joseph was rejected, right, by his brothers. And now Moses is coming in thinking that God's hands upon him to be a leader, and he comes there to, to bless his people, but then he's rejected, and so he departs and leaves. He was rejected as well, first time around. Well, Stephen goes on then to share more about the storyline. He says, well, Moses left... You know, several years passed, 40 years passed, and then he's left, but then guess what happens with Moses? You know the story well. It's like in the middle of chapter 7. It says, Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, right? And you know that story well. It's a very familiar story. It's an incredible story to see how God revealed himself to, uh, to uh, Moses. Uh, it was the burning bush experience. And so God steps back into Moses' life a few years and years later, and he says, Hey, Moses, to take off your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy ground and I've got something in store for you and God calls him out to go back to, to Egypt and set his people free, right? And it's an incredible story. And so Moses is given this, this responsibility to, to go back. And what's interesting in the words that Stephen shares, he says this, this Moses, these are the words now to the council as he's went through this story. It talks about how God is the one ultimately working through Moses to be the deliverer of the people. And remember, Stephen has the accusations against him that he's like blasphemous about Moses, as if he doesn't respect Moses. And so he's telling the story of Moses. I understand that story of Moses, and I connect with the story of Moses. That this is our fathers, this is our history, our heritage. I'm with you on this. But listen to what he says. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And so Stephen lets the people know that I embrace the story of Moses and, and he, was a, he was an incredible ruler and redeemer called out by God. Redeemer, you can almost say synonymous is the word Savior. And the word used there is the same word that's used of Jesus in Luke 24. Remember, Luke's the writer here. He wrote Luke and Acts. 
And so he refers to Moses as a ruler and a redeemer. And we know Jesus as a ruler and a redeemer. And Moses was like, like that in some respects. Or Jesus was like Moses in some respects. But oh, so much more. But with Moses, they rejected him. But he sent back to deliver them. And that's exactly what he does. And so Stephen connects with the people that I, I respect Moses. He was called out by God. God's hand was upon him. Providentially, and I embrace that message. But listen, then, if we're, gonna, if we're going to respect and honor Moses, then he adds to the story, to the council that wants to take his life. Listen to what he says. This Moses is one who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. So he has more of the story. If we're going to talk about Moses... Hey, do you remember what Moses said to us, this great patriarch of ours? He said that God is going to raise up someone that is, is like me. And there's other recordings of that that go into deeper detail of that. But we know that would be so much more than Moses. It'll be like Moses in regards to being a ruler and a redeemer, but he will be the ultimate, the ultimate ruler and redeemer. Stephen goes on to share this in verse 38. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. I understand that. I understand his role. He received living oracles. The living word of God came to us through, through God and Moses. And so he, he acknowledges uh, Moses, acknowledges the, the word, the law that came through Moses, and he respects that. They were saying he was rejecting the law in some respects. And he says, no, he gave us the living oracles. Wonderful. But then he goes on to say this, but our fathers, if you recall our history, refused to obey him and thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. You remember the story well when Moses led them out of Egyptian bondage? How in the wilderness, when Moses went up to receive the law from God, right? That the people said, well, I don't know where Moses went, and I don't know, I don't know what he's doing and what, what God, God has in store there. I'm not sure I even care. But Aaron, you're our priest now, and, and since you are in charge, let's, what, let's, let's say we need, we need our own God to worship. And so would you make us a, uh, some, some objects that we can worship? And so Aaron made them what? A golden calf. So this Moses, that was a great figure, the people of God historically, they rejected Moses. They had God's hand upon him. They rejected Moses. And instead, they, they chose their own worship. They made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. And so it tells us in verse, verse 42 that judgment came, but God turned away and gave them over to worship the gods of heaven. So he goes on to give some Old Testament prophecy where the Israelites began to worship like the God of Molech, you know, God of the sun and God of the stars and God of the moon and God of creation, if you will. And so, so what happens here is, Stephen says, listen, I'm, I'm all for Moses, and, and Moses came, and he gave us the word of God, but you know, our people actually rejected the word, word of God, and they began to worship themselves, basically, and created uh, idols that they could worship, and they began to worship the false gods of, of Egypt. Uh, uh, for example, God of Moloch. You, you understand the God of Moloch is the one that were, the people would take their little children, their little babies, and do what? They'd sacrifice the babies and burn them. And the worship fires before him. And so God basically says here is what Stephen records for us that the God just turned them over to their foolishness. What about the temple? The temple, he was accused of having no respect for the temple. And so Stephen says, listen, our fathers, speaking of Moses specifically, had the tent of witness. Have the tent of meeting. God gave directions for Moses to create this tent in the wilderness, a place of worship where God's presence would come and meet with Moses and meet with the people. And so we've had that tent way before we ever had the temple built in, in Jerusalem. We can go way back in, way back here when we were even in the wilderness and God had a tent, a place of worship, but he was working here. Yeah, he can work today in Jerusalem in the temple here. He was working with Abraham. By the way, God doesn't need to be any specific place to work. He's just God of everything. And, but we had a tent of meeting. And Moses, Moses obeyed that tent of meeting exactly how it was supposed to be uh, created and, and, and built. And so he carried that along. And so, so we, we honored the tent of meeting back then with Moses. And, and then that came through Joshua and even come up to David. And David says, hey, instead of a tent of meeting, let's build a, let's build, build a beautiful site here out of stone, right? But David wasn't given the, 
the privilege of doing that. And so Solomon built a temple eventually in Jerusalem. And so, yeah, if you want to talk about temple and places, sure. We had it back in, back here. God brought it along here, and he's got it now in Jerusalem. And so, so yes, we have temple, but God's always been at work in various ways with his people. And so Stephen just kind of walks him through this reality. And he walks him through the fact that it's carried all the way up through David and Solomon and now their own people. But the reality is, despite a place of worship, if you're going to worship the false gods, that's the problem. Is you're worshiping idols. And you're worshiping self ultimately. And the reason God even brought them out of the wilderness was to lead them to worship the one true God. So Stephen records this about God. It says in verse 49, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? For what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? In essence, yes, we have a temple, but but God is the ultimate builder, and he, he's, he's made everything, and there's, there's no place that ultimately um, restricts God or puts God in a stone box. It's just not possible. And so we, we're grateful for a place of worship. Um, but the place of worship it doesn't mean that God resides there only. He resides everywhere. He is God. And he's always been at work among us. And so we can go back through our history with Abraham and, 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 uh, and Joseph and the patriarchs and, and Moses and David and Solomon. All throughout our history, God has always been at work. He has a certain plan and purpose that he has been fulfilling and bringing about his big message to us. But the reality is, if I look back at our history, as Stephen's talking to the council, that we have as a people oftentimes rejected the very purposes and will and ways and message of God moving forward. Getting a little serious now, a little, little gravity here. And so the opportunity was given to Stephen, and he walks him through the history and then this is what he says. The history has a point. We've seen that Joseph was rejected, but he was a, a deliverer of the people. We've seen that Moses re was rejected, but he ultimately was a deliverer of the people. But then Jesus has now come. And Jesus was what? Rejected by his people. And yet he is the ultimate deliverer. He is the ultimate redeemer. He is the ultimate prince of peace. He is the ultimate king of Israel and all the nations, all those who trust in him. And Stephen then needs to let the, his own people know that you have rejected Christ. Listen to what he says. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and in ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Who's he speaking of, church? Who's the righteous one? It's Jesus. So the prophets were testifying the one who's coming. He's now come, this righteous one. But just like our people have rejected the prophets and the message before, they did so with Jesus as well. Just like they rejected Joseph, they rejected Moses, they rejected the prophets, they rejected the righteous one who brings salvation to us. They rejected the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. So there you have, in simple terms, the death of Christ, the cross of Christ, is in the storyline. And it says, you will receive the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. The law, the prophets, they've been given, but yet you've rejected the very words of God and the coming of the Messiah. So Stephen has gone back through all of history to connect with his own brothers there in Jerusalem, the council, but he's connecting with them in order to point them to the reality is that we as a people have ultimately rejected oftentimes what God is, uh, has in store for us. And we have ultimately rejected Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It's Paul who would later say, a saved Jewish person, God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is the righteous one. And his sacrifice, his, his cross event, uh, his giving of his life as a sacrifice for our sins, it's in him, in faith in him, in faith in the Messiah, this righteous one, that we are made right with God. And Stephen wants his own brothers to embrace that message. And so Stephen gets serious and calls him out. There's a time and place for that. And so he, he's doing it truthfully, 
and he's doing it lovingly. And in this case, sometimes love is very direct. You are stiff-necked people. You are hardened in your hearts, and you're rejecting God. This is not the first time you've heard the message. You've heard the message over and over and over again by our own people in recent days, by Peter and John, etc. But down through our history, God has been speaking to us, but you reject them. And I'm calling out as the Holy Spirit, if he would have, if he would have blessing here, would call you to understand and believe in the righteous one. His name is Jesus. The response of the people is the end of our story here with Acts. It says, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. I thought about a dog that uh, we no longer have. Uh, but this dog, I think, was part pit bull. And one day we were out walking. He loved to get reared, reared up at trucks. And, and I think he actually just loved trucks. Wanted to get in the truck uh, with whoever's driving by. He wasn't angry, but he'd get me angry because he'd just rear up. And he'd walk with him and bark and yell. And, and so I, I kicked our dog just to get his attention, to get him to calm down. And I guess my foot kind of went up underneath his belly, caught him in the wrong place, I guess, but really lit him up. And when I lit him up, man, he turned to me, and it was like a different dog personality I hadn't seen before. I mean, it, it was angry and enraged, and I saw the teeth, and I was trying to step back a little bit, and I was losing my balance, and in a flash, I'm thinking, this dog would take me out if he wanted to. I mean, he was ready for blood. Fortunately, it didn't happen that way, but he was enraged to kill. That's the way that God's people, the Israelites are right here with Stephen. He just, I think he, I think he genuinely loves them, just wants them to come to Christ. But it says they're enraged. The contrast that it says, but the, but full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen that is, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Can you imagine that? Stephen is in a context where the people are enraged. They beat his other brothers like Peter and John. And he's seeing their faces. And he's probably thinking, this is not going to end well. And as he's seeing the enraged faces, he looks up and, and God just chooses to give him, in that moment, this, an incredible blessing. He sees the, the glory, glory of the throne room, if you will, and the, and the, and the, and the glory of, of God and, and the glory of Jesus there before him his hope. And one thing we've seen in the book of Acts is that repeatedly they preach the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. If you only preach the cross and Christ is crucified, what hope is there in that alone? But Christ is risen. And so here we see that, that Stephen looks up and he sees, he sees uh, Jesus at the right hand of God standing. And, and it's got to be an incredible vision to see in the context of crisis where he may lose his life. And he sees that. He could hold on to it, or he could even pass that on in love, and that's exactly what he does. He says, Behold, <laughs> he said, I see the heavens opened, and, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's talking to the Jewish council that is enraged at him, and he's pointing to Jesus. Hey, look, there's the throne room, and there's Jesus standing right there, and, and, the, and the resurrected one, the one you crucified, there he is. you imagine the response of the people if they did not want to receive the message by the Spirit? It says they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. Think about kids who don't want to hear a certain message that's true. They just stopped their ears up and these adults are doing this. They do not want to hear the message of Jesus and the, the glory of the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They want to have nothing to do with this and so they, they close their ears and it seems like almost like in a mob violence that they they rushed towards Stephen. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments. Think about the outer robes. If you got a robe on, it's a little less, less intense to get, to, to get too physical. Like with a t-shirt on, you can get more agile, right? They lay down their robes so they can get more agile with, with the stones that are being thrown at Stephen. It tells us they lay down their robes, their, their outer garments, at the feet of a young na man, man named Saul. Very interesting side note. And as they were stoning Stephen, here's Stephen's last response. It's not one of vitriol. It's not one of 
anger back at you or enragement back at you or curse back at you. And if, I, if I'm going down, then here's a few words for you. There is a few words for them, but it's not, if I can be, have the grace to say this, because I think it relates to our context. It's, it's, not, it's not F you, it's L you. I just love this. It's, it's, it's L you. Listen to what Stephen's final words are. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Which is a, a beautiful way of saying for believers, just, just passing on to be in the presence of Christ. But he was killed, so we know what took place. Isn't it intriguing how the last sayings of, of Stephen, really a prayer, if you will, pray to Jesus, hey, Jesus, receive my spirit. I think Jesus said the same words before God the Father when he was on the cross, when his time had come. Father, receive my spirit. And then I think Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he also looked down at those who were persecuting him and said, Father, hold not this against them, for they do not know what they are doing and and Stephen has the same words Lord do not hold this against them as he then fell asleep pretty remarkable isn't it no vitriol no cursing no outburst of anger as stones are being thrown at him so in tune and led by the spirit of God that he's simply loving them as he's being persecuted to death stoned by Death by stones. And what's incredible, we will close it off here, is that Saul was watching all this. And what happens after this is great persecution of the church, and the church is scattered. And we'll come back to that next week. Or the week after, the church is scattered. But the story ends with Stephen being stoned and praying the prayer, Hey, God, forgive them. Be gracious to them. And would you receive my spirit? Can I come into your presence? Pretty remarkable. Well, how did I do? It's 10 to 11. I don't know when it began. I should it be long, but sometimes we just need to sit longly, if I can say it that way, under the history of Israel, under the history of God. And so it's a lot of history that was brought through that Luke wanted us to have, that God's spirit wanted us to have that Stephen felt led to share in his context. But if we, could, if we could close our time together, we can then look back and just briefly say, well, what, what does God have in store for that history for us? What, what, is, what is the history in, in our context in our time? How could we maybe even apply it to fathers? For dads that are here, what, what do we do with this? Maybe you can think of a few thoughts in your own minds if you walk through this. I would say as dads, let's, as we shared earlier, let's walk through open doors that God gives us. There's going to be open doors, fathers. Walk through the open door with a gracious, gracious, Christ-centered, God-centered, loving attitude and spirit. You may get persecuted, walk through that door. But if God's opening up, trust what he's got in store for it because I think God's got a beautiful plan. And I said, if we had the time to look into Saul's life, you all know Saul becomes Paul, and Paul writes most of the things we've been teaching for years here at Water's Edge. Uh, the story continues. Saul, Paul, never fought, forgot about the stoning of Stephen. He brings it up in his testimony years later. So let's walk through open doors. You know, let's trust God that when we walk through open doors and we're seeking to be faithful, that, that we may not always know exactly what God is doing, but... His story is unfolding for His glory, and we can trust Him in that. I, I thought probably one, one, maybe the highest thing that came to my mind as far as priority would be, would be this in regards to, the, regards to the message. It, it would be this: is that uh, it, it, as a father or as as uh, people gathered with God, that the greatest, the greatest message. Uh, I might say is this is that is that we as fathers we live and 
carry out our lives, not in perfection, yes, but in such a way uh, that we are genuine in our faith, that no matter the outcome of our lives, that somehow our lives can be used for God's glory and testify of His goodness and our faithfulness in Him. And Stephen was that kind of man. He was full of faith. He was full of wisdom. He was full of power of the Holy Spirit. And the door opened up. It was a difficult door, but he walked through it, and he trusted God uh, even on, unto death. And I, I believe God richly blessed him. He, he received an incredible you know, vision of Christ in ways that I can only imagine. And so God was faithful to, to Stephen as he walked through faithfully just to be a witness and a testimony of the goodness of God. Let's be that kind of men as dads. Let's be that kind of people as the body of Christ. Stephen would not know. Maybe did in a moment. I, I'm not sure he knows, knows now. Think about this. Stephen did not know the story of Saul. What would come after him? I mean, that is incredible. The story of Saul and Paul, what came after him in regards to how God used Paul. Who saw this, this testimony of Stephen and the persecution of Stephen, never forgot it and how God used that. We don't know exactly the, the seeds that we plant as God's followers and as fathers, how God may use them, but let's just be encouraged that God will use them, I believe. As seeds are planted. Let me close with this story. It was a story I read this week, and I was really encouraged by it. It was a seed that was planted. This is helpful. It's Father's Day. This is for mothers. The seed was planted by a mother, but it's about our Heavenly Father. It was a young man. I think he grew up in Miami. I think that, I think that was a setting. And he, he'd gotten off on the wrong track uh, in, in various ways. But he didn't know necessarily a right track, a right lane. He was not raised in the church. wasn't raised to know God and who God is. And, and so, But he, he got into a, a lifestyle that was very... Uh, very dark and, and very uh, dangerous with various complications uh, and hardships. It doesn't lead to blessing in, in any way. Uh, and, and in his context, though, um, the church was seeking out to reach this young man. His name was Randy. They're trying to reach out to Randy, and, and, and Randy, he was just he was hard to reach, and, and he was difficult, and um, he was hard to read, hard to understand. But Randy began to come around the church some, to come to some of the events. And, and so Randy expresses how he's telling the story, how he came to a church event, and the reason he came was simply to uh, mock the Christians, right, to kind of make fun of them and to be as outrageous as he could. And so the dress that he wore to that event, um, how he was dressed, what he was going to say, he was trying to get as much attention that would irritate them as much as possible. And so Randy comes to the event, and he's sharing this event. And one of them was a Bible study. And at this Bible study, though, he said they would always include him. They'd, all, they'd always make him feel welcome, always make him feel loved. And so they would even let him, if they're reading the scriptures, and, all right, Randy, this is your time. You read this portion of scripture. Make him feel a part of the Bible studies. And so Randy just thought that was kind of weird because he was there to irritate them and kind of make fun of them and just uh, ruffle their feathers. Well, at this one particular Bible study, you know, Randy's being involved. He's being loved. And, and he's trying to understand these people that call themselves Christians, believers in God. And so at this event, uh, one of the ladies prays to close out the time together. And when she's praying, she prays to Abba Father. And, and he hears that Abba Father phrase, and it's strange to Randy. Like, what was that? You know, like a foreign language to him. And so he, he wants to go up and talk to the, the mom afterwards and ask about this Abba Father. So he does. And he goes up to this mom, and he says, he said, you prayed this term Abba Father in, in, uh, in your prayer, he said, the only uh, Abba I know is, is, uh, is the band. Remember there's a band? They pronounce themselves Abba, uh, and they had back in the 70s the Dancing Queen song, you know? And that's what he tells us. He said, you know, that's the only Abba I know, and, and Dancing Queen, and, and, and I think he begins to kind of maybe sing to her. Is that kind of the impression you get? He's kind of having fun with this, like, what are we talking about? Abba, Abba. I don't get that. And, and he says that she laughs along with them. It was funny in the moment, right? He kind of laughs, and they kind of enjoy the story together, and and, and she says, I, I get that, but he, here's, what, here's why I prayed Abba Father. I prayed Abba Father because the, the term is actually a very special term. It, it, it speaks of intimacy. It speaks like calling our Heavenly Father, our great God, like Daddy. It's like an intimate, close, personal uh, relationship with God, and so that's the term I use. And Randy shares that when she shared that to him, that in listening to it, she, she knew that, I mean, he knew that her heart was just full of compassion and, and love for, for him, and and, and how she shared that, and the heart in which she shared it, and the love in which it came across to him, Randy shares that that was the, that was the first seed in his mind 
that he looked back on three years later is the seed that was planted with her sharing what Abba Father meant to him that eventually led to him coming to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, radically changing him, drawing him out of a lifestyle that was very dark, and bringing him into the kingdom of God. It was that seed that was planted by this mom saying, Abba, Father. Church, we never know how God's going to use us to plant seeds. I'm sure Stephen did not ask for this particular moment, most likely, and how it played out. But God used him to plant a seed for Christ. He's the first martyr of the church, as far as what we have recorded. A church father would later record, a couple hundred years later, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, God uses the blood that's shed to grow his church and build his church and expand his church. Stephen would not have known that in a moment. He's just simply being faithful, but God used him greatly. If we as fathers, if we as God's people, will let God use us, like Stephen, to seek to be full of wisdom, full of the Spirit, uh, full of 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 power by the Spirit, full of love and grace, I believe God will use us to continue to build His church. The church, our church, is all about the righteous one, and His name is Jesus. If you don't know Jesus this morning, my heart beat would be that you would hear the voice of God saying, see my son, and trust in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. Now, the beauty of the day, of the cloud coverage of the day, the breeze of the day, Lord, to be out here to worship and to hear your your story. History is about you, and the his part is Jesus, and so thank you for the opportunity to reflect back of how you've worked to bring forth the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our righteous one. Lord, we love Jesus. We thank you that he's the great shepherd of our church that reigns over us. We know that through Jesus Christ that lives can be transformed in beautiful ways. Thank you for transforming our life for those of us who are in Christ, Lord, and we pray for those who are hearing about Jesus, maybe the first time, Lord, they might be drawn to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. To see their lack of holiness and God's holiness and not be fearful in a way that runs away, but fearful in God's fear that draws us to say, God, I need you and I want you, and trust in Him and confess sin and find the cleansing that comes through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray you work that here in Clarksville, work that here in Lake Country, work that here in America and around the nations. Draw all people to, to you, Jesus, and build your church. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We're grateful. You are a great God. Thank you for the witnesses you put before us, like Stephen. Lord, I thank you for the grace of the people that have extended time this morning to go through this history lesson. Lord, may it, may it stay in our hearts and minds somehow, some way, that you might use it for your glory this week. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. Hey, it's been great to have you all here on campus this morning. Uh, it's not been 95 degrees today, but it could be next Sunday. And we like to shift things up a little bit, shake things up a little bit. And so just kind of want to plant a seed. Next Sunday, it's still 9 o'clock as our meeting time. To mix it up, though, we're actually going to take a break. And this will be like, ah, oh, we're going to be indoors, a radical thing. We're going to be indoors next Sunday. Uh, doesn't mean we're not coming back outside. Uh, but uh, my, uh, we have a guest speaker who's now a part of our church. Uh, he's going to be speaking next Sunday. And uh, he's uh, in his mid-80s. We thought it would be great to have him indoors. And that's my dad, uh, Dr. Glenn Bohannon. And so he's going to be speaking next Sunday. But we're going to be indoors, take a break. And so I hope you can be with us next Sunday, 9 o'clock. And uh, may God's grace be with you and have a blessed week in the Lord. Amen.